So the recording has started. I'd like to hand this over back to UTRGV. And if you'd like to just state your name with, and it, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Ms. Ramirez. Um, my name is Dr. Denise Longoria, and I am the Director of Online Programs and Distance Learning in the School of Social Work at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, we are very happy to be here with you today and, um, and have the opportunity to, to talk to you a little bit about this topic. Um, joining me today is Professor Vanessa Ibarra and I'll let her introduce herself, but you're muted, Vanessa. Yes. Okay. Hi, I am Vanessa Ibarra. Uh, like Dr. Longoria mentioned, I am a professor here at UTRGV at the Laredo campus. So for those of you who don't know, we're in Laredo now. Um, and this is uh, our first, first year that we have a couple extra professors aside from Dr. Longoria. She's been doing this a while in Laredo, uh, but we're expanding. Um, and thank you for having us to present on this very important topic. Uh, so I don't know if I can be granted permission to share. Are you able to share, Vanessa? Let me see. Okay, there. Perfect. All right, let me see. Yep, you got it. All right. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about traumatic events and post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we will be talking about, we're gonna be, first of all, be explaining what a traumatic event is. And we will be talking about some of the reactions that people will have to trauma because it can vary from person to person. What some of the red flags to look for are and how people might experience some of those symptoms. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why people react the way that they do uh, when faced with a traumatic experience as well as the effects of trauma on school performance. Um, because you know, when children experience it, it may look a little bit different than it, than it might look for, for an adult. And then last, but certainly not least, we'll be talking about when and where you can look for help. So the first thing that we wanna talk about is just thinking about some of the assumptions that we make you know, as individuals most of us make assumptions about life. We go about our daily lives making assumptions that we are generally going to be safe, that things are going to be a certain way, and that it's predictable. You know, like this morning, probably most of us left our houses. If, if you've already left your house, I have. <laughs> um, and if you haven't, you know, just think, we, we, we start our day thinking about, okay, today I'm going to be doing this, 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 and this. I need to go here, I need to go there, and these are the things I'm gonna do. Um, these are the people I will see, et cetera. We're already, we already have a plan in our minds. We might even have a plan for the weekend, for a week from now, for a month from now, you know, because we kind of expect that things are just going to be falling into place and that we're gonna be able to, to do all the things that, that we are planning to do. We, um, we don't expect that there's going to be anything out of the ordinary that's going to happen to mess with that event that we're, that we're planning for or the, the, the schedule that we're planning to follow. We typically go about our day just expecting that things will be okay. Um, for the most part, I think we all have a belief that, you know, everyone is good and nobody intends to do anything bad or malicious, that no, no one has any malicious intent toward, toward us. When there are times of crises, um, for example, when, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic started, you know, we we all have generally will have a belief that people who are in charge are gonna 
tell us what's in our best interest, you know, to do. They're going to guide us. They're going to give us, uh, um, they're going to give us advice about, you know, how do we handle this particular situation? So, and, and, and all of these are generally going to be dependent on our, our, just our own experiences, of course, our, our own values, and just our beliefs about life. But when a traumatic experience happens, pretty much all of these assumptions that we carry with us on a daily basis are shattered. So what is a traumatic event? A traumatic event is going to be something that is very intense. It's going to be something that is overwhelming. It's something that is out of the ordinary and it affects our well being, whether it's our physical well being or our emotional well being. Um, it can be something that's like a one time situation, or it can be something that is recurrent, such as, such as abuse. Um, typically, abuse happens over and over and over again, but trauma can also be a one-time event, such as a, a, a very serious accident. And we'll talk about some of the specifics in a few minutes, um, but it can, it, can, it can be either one. Generally, when someone experiences a traumatic event, it's because it's so overwhelming that even though we may have pretty good coping mechanisms, you know, where when something stressful happens, most of us have coping mechanisms that we use. You know, we, we may seek out um, support from our family, support from our friends. Um, we might say, you know what, instead of um, stressing out over this, I'm gonna watch a good movie. I'm gonna have a good time. But when something traumatic happens, none of those things seem to be enough. All, all of our normal coping resources are, are not enough for, mm -hmm. for dealing with that Good particular enough. event. Or what was the, the item? Yeah, yeah. I am. Sí, pero por qué? Por qué? Um, can, you, can you mute yourselves, please? Thank you. Can everybody mute themselves, please? Um, and then finally, trauma can be very personal. It's it, what what might be traumatic for one person may not be traumatic may not be considered traumatic for another person. So those are all things that we need to take into consideration. Um, when we define what a traumatic event is. Um, please mute yourself. Okay. So what are some traumatic life experiences? Um, it could be... Can, can you mute yourselves, please? Yes, I'm yes. not sure who it is. Like I said, I mean, I don't want to put more pressure on. Or we can, oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Lombardi, I'm trying to. to okay, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so what are some traumatic life experiences? Um, the first is being the victim or even the witness of a crime. As we were preparing for this um, presentation, uh, Missy Barra and I were talking about it and I was telling her about it, um, a time when uh, a friend and I used to walk at a, at a neighborhood park here in Laredo and we were walking along, this is at six o'clock in the morning and we were walking in the park and then all of a sudden there's a, a like just a, a business plaza right next to the park and we saw this truck pull up to, but in reverse to this, to the building and we didn't think anything of it. And then all of a sudden they reversed like really fast 
and and so that they could crash into the building um and then they proceeded to like steal stuff from there and when we saw that i mean we were both like in shock and i was and i was telling miss ibarra i said you know i rem i remember feeling oh my god like kind of kind of scared almost like very vulnerable and um, almost like something was going to happen to us because we had just witnessed it. So a traumatic experience can be something that ha just happens to the person themselves, or it can even be witnessing something happen happening to someone else. Um, the same goes with an accident. It could be being involved in an accident or it could be even witnessing one, you know, I mean, sometimes there are some really horrible accidents. And if you, even if you were not part of it, but you witnessed it, or you're somehow involved in it, like maybe it's a family member and it was something that was uh, a very tragic accident, it can also create some, some trauma. Um, a serious medical illness or a disability, you know, sometimes things happen very quickly. Um, you know, it's happened when when people fall ill and then things happen in a, a, a very, very quickly. And all of a sudden they're needing all these different um, treatments or perhaps they they end up having to have an amputation or, you know, so many different things can happen and there's no time to process or even stop to think about what's going on. That can be experienced as a traumatic life experience. Domestic violence, um, including child, physical or sexual abuse, um, any kind of physical or sexual assault, Again, being the victim of it or even witnessing it can be considered a, a traumatic life experience. Exposure to combat, to war, to torture. You know, in the schools, it could be just being exposed to, to fights um, or, or, or being exposed to bullying or being victims of bullying. Those can be considered traumatic life experiences. Um, natural disasters, you know, experiencing anything from an, from an earthquake to a hurricane or a tornado. Um, and the aftermath of that can be traumatic. And then, um, like I had already said, you know, witnessing violence. Um, this is not a be all and end all it list, but these are probably some of the more common ways that that people may experience some trauma. So when we think of, when we when we consider reactions, um, we kind of have all of these together: the reactions, red flags, and symptoms. These are some of the things that we might see um, in people, and it's gonna be and it's gonna vary depending on the person. Um, it's important to consider some of these things when when we see different reactions because it could they could mean different things. So I'm going to go through the list and then we, we can or I'll I'll talk a little bit about that. So the first is mistrust, you know, just not being able to to have any kind of trust in anyone. There is a possibility that maybe there was something traumatic that happened for that person. Um, fear of losing control, and uh, you know, when when we see that someone is really trying to control everything around them in terms of what happens, in terms of what people do, in terms of what they do, in terms of what happens to them, etc. And of course, we know that. Mm, there are many things that are not within our control, um, but but still, there. Um, when when a person has experienced trauma, they have such a fear of losing that control that they will do anything that they can to try and gain as much control over things as as the, as much as possible, 
uh, you know, as much as they can. Sometimes we will see rage reactions. Um, these can be internal or external. And so what that means is that sometimes, you know, it can be toward someone. Sometimes it can be doing something to themselves or, or um, just really um, feeling some of that rage. And that may come out in different ways as well. In children, it might, it might be in the form of, a, of what we call a temper tantrum. You know, sometimes we think kids are, are son chiflados, you know, they're just spoiled. But sometimes kids may be having some of these reactions because of, because of what they've experienced. And so these are important things to pay attention to. Um, guilt and self-doubt or shame, you know, feeling like, Oh man, like if it, the, the guilt can happen, you know, like in, for example, in situations of abuse, feeling that, that, that they're responsible for the abuse, um, the self doubt, you know, of, wow, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really very good at this. I'm not very good at that. I don't know, um, if I'll be able to, do X, Y, or Z, uh, sometimes feeling shame, you know, that, that they've somehow contributed or brought this on, on themselves, like they deserved to be treated a certain way, or they deserve for something to happen to them. Sometimes people will react in that way. Sometimes there is excessive worry. And then, um, be, again, going back to that fear, Again, going back to that fear uh, uh, of losing control, there can also be some just excessive worry of, you know, what am I going to do about this? Or what if this happens? Or what if that happens? And, and constantly thinking about um, a particular situation a lot of the time, you know, maybe not wanting to leave. Sometimes people don't want to leave their, their home because they're afraid you know, something is going to happen. Sometimes they don't want to, if someone's been in, in a car accident, they may not want to drive anymore and just be constantly worried about uh, another accident happening. It can happen in many different, it, the, the worry can happen in so many ways. There can be isolation and also avoidance, you know, where it's like, instead of trying to get some support or or even talking about what's happened how the person is feeling etc we might just you know what i'm just not going to think about it i i just and and so then sometimes the person will even end up isolating themselves they don't want to talk to anyone they don't want to see anyone they don't want to do anything and before you know it they are just completely, completely isolated. Sometimes people will experience relationship problems when they've experienced um, trauma because they um, aren't sure how to, how to handle it, how to ask for some help. And so they may end up taking it out on the other person or reacting to the other person because of what they've been through. Sometimes people will experience some changes in their sleeping or even the, in, in their eating habits. With the sleeping, it can be where they just want to sleep all the time, or maybe they can't fall asleep, or maybe they're constantly waking up, um, you know, just sleep in little spurts. I've had, um, clients who can't sleep in a certain area, for example, in their room, if something happened in their particular room, they may not be able to sleep there. They have to go sleep in another room, in the living room or somebody else's room in their home, but not in theirs. So the sleep disturbances can vary. With the eating habits, some of the changes may be where the person is either um, not eating or eating very little, or perhaps they're, they're really indulging and, and eating much more than usual. And so we might see that there's a, 
some weight loss or perhaps a, some weight gain and it happens very quickly. Other um, red flags is when there are repetitive and intrusive thoughts, you know, where the person is going about their day and then all of a sudden they're thinking about, okay, this um, traumatic event over and over or what might happen or what could happen, worrying, again, going back to the worry and it's just like there and it's just constant. Focusing on the past, you know, just thinking about, okay, about what happened about that particular or uh, event or events, if there were sometimes there are more than one, um, and just focusing on that and not being able to move forward and recognizing, okay, I'm not there anymore, I'm not in that same danger, but sometimes the person will like, continue to, to perseverate on that. Sometimes people will experience memory loss um, as a way of coping. People will just completely put it out of their mind and just block the event completely. And so they experience um, perhaps the event and, and then things that perhaps that are associated with it as well. And so there's almost like little gaps in their memory. Sometimes people will experience crying spells um, just randomly. You know, I don't know what made me cry. I just started crying. And, and a lot of the time it may be related to, to the, the trauma that they've experienced. And then, of course, uh, coping, another red flag or symptom may be that the person is um, using different substances or engaging in other self-destructive behaviors, other self-destructive behaviors, you know, such as um, cutting themselves, uh, hanging out with people that are not going to be good for them. Um, be becoming sexually promiscuous, taking just risky behaviors, things that can that can get them into either get them into trouble or cause them harm are, are what we're talking about when we're talking about other self-destructive behaviors. So what are the reactions going to be influenced by? A lot of it is going to be influenced by these different things that you see on here. What we mean by, you know, we, we all of us grow up with different beliefs, different traditions, different values, etc. And so we may experience things differently. For example, if someone grew up in a home where um, yelling and name calling and um, spankings or even beatings are the norm, and they may not recognize that that is not okay, that it's that that's abuse. And then, whereas for someone who did not grow up in a in a in a home like that that happens the first time their reaction may be stronger it may be like a, a a much more intense reaction to the same treatment because of the the uh values that 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 they were raised with depending on on the dynamics um depending on the resources that we have available to us, that can make a big difference. You know, if we have a, a strong support system and we have someone to turn to, to talk to, to ask for help from. And it's not just emails and ads you need to think about. Scammers can grab information off of social networks. Okay, there we go. 
Um, I think I think I, I think I got muted. Um, so so depending on the resources that we have and how quickly we can uh, how quickly we can engage coping mechanisms, how quickly we can engage some of those resources, the reactions may be uh, either more or less intense. And now I will go ahead and hand it over to Ms. Ibarra. Okay, so factors that increase the risk of long-term problems are the proximity to the traumatic event. So uh, how close were you to the situation? A lot of times, uh, I know Dr. Longoria mentioned situations of abuse. Uh, so it might be that it happened to you. It might be that it happened to your child. Uh, and going back to that fear that was experienced at that moment, that can be something that would affect um, whether it's something that just affects you at the moment, because it might be something, there's certain things that happen naturally. Some of the um, red flags that Dr. Longoria went over, those are some things that might happen right after the event. Uh, and that's normal, actually. For some individuals, this will be something that happens for weeks or months or years. And so those are the people that we're going to focus on a little bit more right now uh, when we talk about long-term problems. So for some of those people, that proximity, like it happened to their child. And so they might be um, maybe struggling a whole lot more with it than maybe um, if it happened to your neighbor. Uh, being injured or knowing someone who was killed or injured during the traumatic event can it increase those uh, long-term problems also. Um, minimal coping skills prior to the event. So going back to what Dr. Longoria was talking about right now in terms of, you know, we all have different beliefs, different values, different resources available to us. So we all grew up with um, maybe different ways that we handle stress. Uh, if Maybe you grew up with a parent who every time something happened, they exploded and they didn't know how to handle it. And maybe they um, they were a wreck for weeks or something. You're going to learn that. You know, you're going to learn that, okay, this is how we handle problems. And so you might have, your child might have a few coping skills in place. If it's someone who maybe... Um, has a lot of coping skills where they learn to maybe change their thoughts and say, you know what, this was a scary moment, but I'm not in that moment anymore. That child will probably uh, have the reactions right afterwards and then move on with their life. Whereas maybe that child who didn't have those coping skills is going to have the long-term problems come up. Uh, previous history of unresolved trauma is another thing. So sometimes we'll... I. I used to work at the Children's Advocacy Center and, you know, sometimes we'd have kids come in where uh, they were abused and then we'd speak to their parents and their parents had been abused as well. And sometimes we found that those parents were the ones who were starting to have a lot of triggers come up because they had the history of their own unresolved trauma in the past. And so Sometimes we had to work with those parents because they never worked through their own trauma. Kids, there's kids with complex trauma where maybe one traumatic event has happened. You know, there was a whole list of different things that can be traumatic. So maybe there was one traumatic event that they never really worked through. And now a new event happens and they're right back to square one. And we're going to talk a little bit um in a little bit about fight, flight, freeze to kind of bring it back to that. Uh, sometimes there's lack of resources or services. I know our community is one that sometimes lacks a few resources and services. Uh, so that can be something that can also be a risk for that long-term problem. So it's important for us to look out there, you know, even outside of our own community. Uh, I know 
COVID uh, changed a lot of things. And one of the positives of it was that it helped us connect with people online and now we can access services online. Uh, another thing would be watching excessive media coverage about the event. So this could be, let's say maybe there was a natural disaster or a school shooting. I know when the Uvalde shooting happened, I don't know about the rest of you out there, but I was on TikTok watching all the stories about it and staying up to date. And I was, as a parent myself, I was crying almost every night watching that. And that was not helpful, right? I had to say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to watch this anymore because being exposed to that constantly can lead to those uh, long-term problems because it takes us a little bit more into what we're going to talk about next, uh, which is, I'm going to start with that fight, flight, freeze response. Oh, somebody. Uh, Sir, no, there. Um, so some long-term impacts. Uh, one of the things that influences these long-term impacts would be that fight, flight, freeze response. We all have this. It's important to know this. It's something that's kind of out of our control. And our brain doesn't know how to differentiate between whether it's, you know, something scary or if we're nervous. And so we all have this response that happens automatically. This is the way that our body and our brain says, all right, this is how we're going to protect you. And so I want to give you examples of what each of these is. Um, we're going to pretend that we are scared of dogs. And so if you are someone who is scared of a dog and maybe you're um, walking in the park and you see a dog, you might enter into one of these different responses. So the first one might be fight, right? You might see that uh, dog approaching you and you might start kicking at it or yelling things at it like, hey, get away, get away from me. So you've entered that fight response. As you've entered that response, your um your heart might start beating a little bit quicker maybe your breathing has changed maybe your body has got intense uh same thing with flight that's another reaction that you might have you might see that dog and you might say oh i'm not walking that way right i'm going to turn this way and i'm going to turn back i'm getting away from the situation so you're fleeing that situation another response might be that you might freeze up and so you might actually stay frozen in that moment, right, physically. And then there's another level to that, um, which I like to call collapse, which is where your mind kind of freezes up or collapses into where you're not thinking straight. Uh, this might look like dissociation, which is basically a fancy way of saying uh, maybe like day daydreaming or out of body experiences where maybe when you're in freeze and you've entered this extra phase, you might not remember the situation. You may, you might forget, you know, um, about when the dog passed by you, you might remember, I saw it in front of me and I don't even know when it passed me because I, you were in that freeze response. And so these are normal reactions that we all have because our wi our brain is wi wired to expect danger. Uh, as this is happening, as we're in fight, flight, freeze mode, you know, I mentioned a little while ago, our body might have changed, right? We might have started with the heart pounding, our breathing might have changed, you know, our body might have got intense, uh, we might have um, gotten nauseous or sick to our stomach. Uh, if we were really, really scared, we might have uh, urinated on ourselves. Uh, we might have started crying, you know, uh, our face might have gotten red and flushed. So we have a lot of different experiences that can happen with our body. Uh, and this is because those stress hormones are flowing all throughout it. As that's happening, we uh, have that sense of safety taken away from us, right? Sometimes we don't feel safe in that moment. And we, as a result, we end up feeling a little bit helpless. Now, Let's say that at that moment, when you saw that dog, you entered either fight, flight, or freeze, but you were bitten by that dog. Oh, somebody's, okay. Uh, let's pretend you were bitten by that dog. 
your flight flight freeze response ends up changing in the future because now that threat has become real right because we all know like as we're going through this we all know all of these traumatic events can happen but we never actually expect for them to happen to us it's this weird thing where we almost feel like yeah all this can happen but we're somehow immune to it in reality we're not though so now we're going to pretend that we were bit by that dog and so the next time that we see a dog our fight flight freeze response is going to activate quicker it's going to last longer and it's going to feel more intense and so this is what's mm-hmm. happening with those people who have been through a traumatic event their normal fight flight freeze response has now been intensified and now it's lasting longer uh and so this can affect their perception of reality, right? Something that might not have been very dangerous before now might seem like it's the end of the world and it's going to end up hurting them. They might enter that dissociation phase that we talked about a little bit ago um, quicker where maybe uh, their mind goes somewhere else. And so with this, you know, I know it says effects on school performance. This is where we really start seeing those effects on school performance. I want you to think of a child who maybe um, had been abused uh, and they are triggered by a word, a smell, um, or, you know, anything, a flashback in school. This is going to start to bring them back. They're going to enter that fight, flight, freeze response when they're in that response, they're not able to really uh, focus. They're not able to, um, they're not able to, to think straight. They're not able to maybe pay attention to what the teacher's talking about. It might set them off back into feeling, you know, with that heart pounding and everything, which might result in those behavior problems and create these relationship problems here. Um, so this is just kind of to get you to see, like, this is how the long-term effects can end up affecting school performance because we think, okay, um, you know, they don't really connect together, but they do because they go back to all those red flag situations that we talked about a little bit ago. So it's important to remember that, you know, some of the long-term things that I talked about right now would almost fall a little bit into that PTSD. And this is not something that happens right away after experiencing a trauma. the first reactions that we talked about are the what happens normally, you know, all the things that Dr. Longoria talked about as red flags. Those are actually normal reactions to a trauma. So when a trauma is happening, they can happen um, in that order. You might start to see those things happen right away and then they kind of start to go away. Uh, but for some people, these uh, these red flags and symptoms will end up lasting longer They might increase in intensity and they'll start to affect their daily functioning, which kind of takes us a little bit back to those school problems, right? That um, it starts to disrupt normal functions of one's life, right? Once it's already disrupting school and it's disrupting maybe the home life, maybe the relationships with other people, this is when it's already started affecting uh, different areas. And this is where PTSD starts coming in. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is an anxiety disorder. Um, Some of its chief characteristics are really more uh, in that feeling, that worry and that fear and apprehension and avoiding certain people, certain situations, maybe even avoiding thinking about what happened. And so this is where we go into once it's lasted, uh, you know, three months or longer, then we're looking at this could be a post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we want to talk about what are some things that we can do when we do hit that um, moment or even before, you know, um, if your child doesn't have good coping strategies and you already know that, it's never too early to start seeking treatment. You know, uh, you can seek counseling or therapy you can uh, maybe go to your PCP or uh, to get a referral for 
uh, a counselor, a therapist, end up getting a referral for a psychiatrist or psychologist. And if you do end up seeing a psychiatrist, they can be evaluated for medication. Um, combination treatment would be doing both at the same time, you know, uh, getting that medication to help with some of the symptoms that they're experiencing. And at the same time, getting them counseling where they're learning new tools and new coping strategies uh, to improve uh, some of their kind of get some more tools into their toolbox for future situations. Because if we go back to those triggers, the triggers are not going to go away overnight, you know, so you have to learn how to manage them. And uh, if you don't know how to manage them, that's where that counseling and therapy comes in because they teach you ways of handling those situations and being to get yourself back to um, a phase of tolerance where you're okay with it and not maybe exploding on somebody, uh, maybe having that temper tantrum that we talked about earlier, um, or um, being unfocused where you're completely able, unable to bring yourself back to the moment. Another great thing out there are self-help and support groups. Uh, going back to the resources in the radio, we don't have a whole lot, but there's a lot of online uh, support groups that either you can get your child into and you can join in with them or as parents you can also join a lot of times there's parent support groups that you can go into and find different ways to help your child um, because it's really important to know treatment works I know sometimes uh we don't want to seek out treatment because we think you know it's going to be okay uh we're going to get past it um, you know, it, it's something that's happening right now, but, you know, they're going to learn to cope with it. And sometimes they don't. So it's good to seek out treatment. Uh, so where can you seek help? Uh, here, uh, locally, you can go with your school teachers, the counselors at school, psychologists or social workers. Uh, that teach at program is actually this program that ends up uh, having monthly uh, sessions to talk about different topics, uh, healthcare providers. So going to your child's pediatrician or your family ph physician to go ahead and get some assistance or referrals out there, uh, community agency. So for trauma specifically, locally, SCAN and the Children's Advocacy Center would probably be your best bet for children specifically because they both have uh, counselors who are trained in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which is specific to children. And it takes the child through phases gradually until they're able to talk about everything. So it's kind of exposing them gradually to what happened, but also at the same time, teaching them new skills so that when they finally do talk about everything, they've already got those skills in their toolbox. So SCAN would be uh, your probably main point of contact if maybe it was a car accident or natural disaster situation because the Children's Advocacy Center does require a referral and that referral must be made by either a law enforcement agency, CPS or Casa Misericordia because usually that is uh, related to a report. So either maybe there was abuse or neglect uh, or maybe they were a witness of a violent crime. And so the, those are situations where the Children's Advocacy Center might come in, you know, if it was maybe domestic violence and the child witnessed it, that's where Casa Misericordia can make the report. Uh, otherwise, for the most part, it's because they were taken in for a forensic interview. Other agencies that can also help would be a pillar, a Border Region Behavioral Health Center. That will be your main point of contact, especially if you're wanting to get medication for your child because they do have a psychiatrist uh, that I don't believe they have one here in person, but they do have one that's able to do telehealth with them. Uh, and then the Gateway Community Health Center is another great resource for um, both the medication and the, the counseling. 
And now you're probably wondering, okay, well, what can I do? How can I help? So first off, recognize that they have been through a traumatic event. You know, as, as I think this is geared more towards parents. And sometimes it's really easy to say, you know, it's fine. It was okay. You know, we're going to get past this. We're going to move on. Sometimes we need to sit with them and just let them have their feelings and, you know, validate that, yes, what they went through was scary and it was not fair because usually traumatic events are not fair. Uh, I'll, I'll allow them time to grieve. Uh, some kids might take longer than others. I think a common misconception that I saw a lot was maybe parents would say, okay, well, the abuse was not that bad. Or, you know, the situation was not that bad. And so we almost have this belief that the worse it is, the longer it should take you. And if it wasn't that bad, you should be able to move past it quickly. When reality, we go back to the coping skills can be different for each person. Um, their experience of it, you know, maybe for you, it wasn't that scary, but for them, it was. And so for some kids, it's going to take a little bit longer than others. And we just need to give them that time to grieve. Uh, we want to stay close to them and not leave them alone. Uh, that's really important because going back to those kids who choose to isolate and a lot of times it's those you know, middle school, high school kids that are like, you know, I just want to deal with this on my own. And they start, you know, locking themselves in their room, or um, maybe they might be present in the living room with everyone, but they're not really present. Their mind is somewhere else, you know, stay close to them. Let them know that you're there. Don't leave them alone as much as they ask you to. Uh, listen to them over and over again, because you might kind of be feeling like, okay, I've already heard this. You've already shared this. Uh, if they're sharing, it's because they haven't moved past them, past it and we're that person to listen to them. So listen to them as much as they need. Limit exposure to the news, social media, and et cetera, especially if it was like a natural disaster, or like, a, you know, God forbid in our community, but, you know, um, a school shooting or something, we want to limit exposure to that. Um, maybe even if it was abuse and you know that that person was arrested and they're coming out on the news, limit that exposure to it to for them. Encourage them to rest, eat, sleep, and do some physical activity. Uh, this one's really important because if we go back to those original red flags, you know, it's really easy for us to say, okay, you're not hungry. That's fine. Go rest up, you know, um, go to bed. And we want them to be able to rest and have some control over their life. That's really important. We want them to have control because they've lost control in a traumatic event. But we also want to encourage them to keep as much of a normal life as possible, you know, because that's what's going to help them uh, progress a little bit quicker. So we want to encourage them to, you know, keep eating, um, sleep as normally as possible. If they're not able to sleep, you know, throughout the night, then that's maybe where you need to start getting some professional help for them. Um, and maybe even just encouraging, you know what, hey, let's go for a walk or let's, you, you like basketball, let's go play basketball at the park or, you know, just encouraging some physical activity because physical activity will release hormones that make us feel happy and make us feel better. So that's going to be really helpful. And we want to organize and encourage help from their support system. So for children, a lot of times, as much as we like to think we are their support system, we are not. <laughs> a lot of times their support comes from their friends. And so uh, maybe even inviting their friends over to come and watch a movie with them or just come and hang out can be really helpful because sometimes um, support is seen in different ways it can just be by having someone make them laugh and make them feel uh like they did before the traumatic event and we want to reassure them that they are acting normal to a traumatic loss that's really important um and it says loss there but it's really to a traumatic event right so we want to let them know that um 
their reactions are not something out of the norm. It's something that a lot of us experience. You can even maybe let them know a little bit of the feelings that you experience. you know, like, yeah, when that happened, I was scared to validate that that is normal. And don't judge, brush their grief or ignore them um, because that can be emotionally exhausting. Uh, it's important to remember trauma is painful. Let them cry, yell, scream, and don't be angry and don't tell them to stop. You know, going back to those temper tantrums, it's really easy for us to be like, come on, get up, you better stop. Or, you know, you're going to be in trouble if you don't stop acting out that way. Uh, sometimes they just need a moment to express uh, what they're feeling inside and kind of externalize that, bring it out of their body. And that's the only way that they know how. Sometimes they don't have the skills to deal with it in some other way or to be able to say, I'm so angry, you know, I don't know how to handle this. And if they don't have those skills to verbalize that, they're going to act out and yell and scream. So sometimes we need to let them as we're giving them those other skills. Um, don't say, I know how you feel or this is hard. That's really important because in reality, we all experience things differently. So we don't know how they're feeling. Uh, and we really want to um, let them know that their experience is unique to them. Uh, it's okay if you don't know what to say and just be present. So sometimes we don't know what to say, but just being there can be really helpful. You know, just sitting next to them um, or just being present with them. Uh, and you can say, tell me how you feel. That's really important because taking us back to some kids, you know, will yell, scream and act out because they don't know how to verbalize it. Sometimes we need to help them. If they don't know how to express certain feeling words, you can ask them to describe what's going on and help them attach a feeling word to it uh, so that they're able to express it in a, um, a healthier manner. And that's basically it. I don't know if anybody has any questions for us. I know somebody asked for the slides in the chat um, and we can certainly share them. Um, we can send them to Ms. Coley and to Ms. Ramirez and then they can share them with you. All Dr. Longoria, excuse me for interrupting. I'm so sorry. This is Melissa Ramirez's no parents and I appreciate you being present in this session. This session is being recorded and it's going to be uploaded. It's going to be oh, uploaded. Perfect. I forgot about that. Yes, I forgot it's about going that. to be yeah. uploaded to the UISD.net website uh, under guidance and counseling. You just need to give me a couple of days. And parents, as always, if you need any assistance, you can always reach out to me. Uh, I'm going to put the number there on the chat. Uh, it's 473. I'm sorry, hold on. 473-5248. Please call me. I know there were a couple of questions uh, on the chat that I just want to address at this time. I understand one parent was saying, you know, that they didn't get assistance on campus. Please reach out to me. I do. I would like to provide you some guidance on that. Um, yes, uh, our counselor student ratio right now is extremely high. You could reach out to the board members so that we can get some more support on that. That's something that I have been uh, pushing for for us to be able to uh, implement more licensed professional counselors because right now we have four licensed professional counselors in our district and we're trying to onboard some more but like uh, Dr. Torres said we're looking for funding we're looking for money um, we're transparent so please parents if you are not getting the help that you need for your students please reach out to me so that I can find the right guidance and the right treatment for your child. Uh, it's real important that we address these situations uh, so that students go, don't go through this trauma because it is a trauma, uh, traumatic experience if a child is going through bullying or uh, whatever the case may be and it is not being addressed, it, it, it is. And uh, we don't wanna be pulling out students from school because there is a state law where students need to be in attendance 90% of the time. 
So that's why I go back to the main thing that, that uh, communication is key. Please reach out to me and we could work together to find the right solution for your child. I do want to thank you, Dr. Longoria, uh, for your assistance and your information this morning. Vanessa, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Torres, uh, Dr. Torres and Darnay, thank you so much for always supporting UISD. We greatly appreciate yes. you. And I, I do. Want... Yes, go ahead, Dr. Torres. Uh, uh, oh no, I also wanted to uh, thank Dr. Uh, Longoria and Professor Ibarra and the UTRD School of Social Work for their continued support of uh, TCHAD and um, with providing these presentations to United ISD. Thank you, Darnay. And you know, if, and if you allow me two seconds, Ms. Ramirez, you know, we it, this wouldn't be a training from social workers and from a school of social work if we didn't talk a little bit about advocacy. And I've been reading the comments from the parents, and I I feel as a parent myself, I feel their angst and their frustration. And I want to remember, mm -hmm. I want to remind our parents how important their voices are. You know, I've been to many school district uh, board meetings where parents just don't show up, right? And and unfortunately, the ones who do show up in these days are calling for metal detectors and more police in, in schools. And we, we can debate whether we need those things or not. But one thing that we can't debate is that we need more mental health professionals in our schools. And we need parents to show up at these board meetings and sign up to speak and call for increased funding for mental health professionals to address the many challenges of our society, right? The last couple of years have been brutal for all of us with COVID and the lockdown and the economic recession and all the instance of racial uh, uh, injustice across the country and, and murders of black and brown people. So we need to let our voices be heard. Please attend your school board meetings and speak up respectfully but forcefully about the need to fund these services. That's how we create change. Yes, absolutely, Dr. Torres. Thank you so much. Parents, I do want to make you aware that these efforts were brought by funding. This presentation and this collaboration was brought by funding from UTRGV. Parents, please voice your concerns at, at, at board meetings. I am pushing as the guidance and counseling department for more licensed professional counselors, more counselors in our district. Your voice needs to be heard, like Dr. Torres said, respectfully at board meetings. Reach out to your board members. They need to be aware. I am trying the best that I can but let your voice be heard. So thank you so much to everyone for being present this morning. I greatly appreciate it. And I do want to remind everyone, March the 3rd, we'll have our last one for the year, and that's on helping your school community manage grief and families, okay? Thank you so much to everyone for being present today. Thank you, UTRGV, uh, until next month. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. To stop the recording, but I can't find. Ms. Ramirez, I know there was, oh wait, I think they already, they might have exited. I think there was someone with their hand up. And so I, I don't mind staying after a little bit to answer any questions. Okie dokie. Yeah. That's, that's great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to stop the recording. Let me Yeah, I thought I had seen a hand too, but then I lost it maybe. Yes, I think they might have exited. They might have, ex <laughs> they might have exited, yeah. Okay. Y'all don't mind staying on for just a few more minutes if I can speak no. to uh, Dr. Longoria, Ms. Ibarra. I don't know if Darnay is still on and Dr. Torres. Um, Darnay is still, is still on. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 